I'm Dylan. And I'm Keon. And this is Zenith Fett Podcast with the most badass gang of space tricyclists in the galaxy because this week we watched Star Drive. Written by Jim Follett. Directed by David Sullivan Proudfoot. And aired on October 19th, 1981. Yeah. So, space tricyclists. Not bicyclists, <laughs> tricyclists. <laughs> they, were, they were like mini ATVs with three, three wheels. Three wheels, <laughs> which actually makes them pretty prone to flipping. And Which they like did pretty in this story, in, actually ineffective a as an ATV. That's the whole point <laughs> of ATVs, all-terrain vehicle. <laughs> but there were a lot of unexpected things in this story. Not just not just the the gang. The, <gasps> gosh, what the rat? Oh, God, I'm space rats. Space rats. I just watched this this morning too. I just watched this well an hour ago now. <laughs> hour and a half. Yeah. In regards to Doctor Who, before we get too deep, once again, I think we're still pre-series 19. Yep. As we will be for the rest of this. I believe so. Actually, there might be just a tiny bit of overlap right at the end. (laughs) It is interesting, and I know we mentioned this on an episode with John, how it seems that our episode release dates have almost synced up with the release dates of the uh, the air dates of the episodes at the end of the podcast, as they were in the beginning. Yeah. Got to hand it to them for... For planning it for this podcast 40 (laughs) years later. Yeah. And I guess we should just jump straight into this, honestly. I don't have anything off the top to say. No, no, I don't either. We should mention that James Follett wrote Dawn of the Gods before this, because otherwise we might forget to mention that later. And we lead off with the crew, the gang in Scorpio. Right. Without Even, ORAC. Without ORAC. And I was, a li- there's actually a line, they mentioned it. They mentioned, like, we shouldn't have left ORAC behind. Yeah. And that was the only way I knew the ORAC wasn't there, honestly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, I'm, they often have, you know, ORAC or often had, I guess, ORAC or Zen not be a part of the story because mm-hmm. they were just, they just weren't. Like, Zen was just there but not doing anything or act just in another room or just there you know right but they have this is the episode that does i think establish that they're using xenon as a base yes and that's where they left orac they didn't just leave him behind somewhere that's what i thought for five minutes <laughs> did we see we saw orac in trader i think yes so it was like huh. he was on the ship in trader yeah so he my, was working on speeding up the ship in trader yeah right so my first impression here was that in between Trader and this, they There's just no. left Orac somewhere. And I was like, is Orac not going to be they a part of the show anymore? They locked Orac. <laughs> I could see this new, unhinged, unlimited Avon just snapping one day and airlocking Orac. Well, I mean, I want to talk about this in a bit, but it feels like Blake Seven's become almost a satire of itself in Series D. A lot of the things that, like... In series A, were like what made Blake Seven, Blake Seven, and like these stories are starting to be like overblown and like made fun of now. Like Slave, the computer on the ship, being like overly apologetic and useless. Orac being super sassy and like useless. Yeah, well, I mean, you think back to series A, and at least that first, at least the first half of the season, possibly, arguably, the whole season was very subdued. Right? It wasn't mm-hmm. a show where. You can just space travel around anywhere you want. You know, it took um, months to get to Cygnus Alpha. Well, uh, except for that time discrepancy, but, you know, whatever. It's just a writing um, thing there. But Yeah, that we, like, conveniently overlooked. <laughs> but, no, it, it, Blake 7 was always a show that I think was never over the top in an overt way. Maybe mm-hmm. in terms of... Actually, I don't know. I don't know if I would ever characterize Series A, at least... And as B, over the top. as over the top. B, even B. Yeah. C, maybe, a little bit. Well, I think that's the thing in Series D. It feels almost like a, uh, I don't know if pastiche is the word I want to go for. Parody. Parody is the word I'm looking for of Series A and B, Blake 7. Because, yeah, Zen and, and Orac typically didn't do a lot in the stories. But now they're, like, almost making fun of that fact with Slave being overly apologetic. And, like, he keeps getting cut off by Avon <laughs> and then... He, like, turns off and he doesn't do anything. Or Orac, like, yeah, Orac in the story, again, doesn't do anything, but they, like, make fun of it because Orac is, like, super sassy about how he doesn't want to work for them and then he makes them do the yeah. work themselves. Orac's sassiness has definitely increased since Orac. <laughs> and it feels like, you know, also with Avon, 
Avon is like way over the top, super controlling. And then also with Villa in the story, Villa gets drunk and like makes all sorts really. of weird sexual passes to Dana and Well, he's Sue also just Lin. pretending to be drunk, so. But at you the know. same time, it's like, well, they're you, making fun. Of, they're like taking that thing that he shoots in series C, like, oh, he's, he's, he's not actually this dumb. He's just pretending. They're like, almost make fun of it in this. He's like pretending, actually, he's pretending to be drunk, but he's doing it in like such an over the top obvious way that it's like, really? We'll, we'll get, we'll get to that scene. But in terms of Avon, what's really interesting to me is that now we get this, you know, more, like I said, unhinged over the top Avon. <laughs> But this is the Avon that starts to feel more like Blake, <laughs> weirdly enough. Well, it's because I think Blake, in his own way, was unhinged. Yeah. But I think Blake's unhingedness was, wasn't as energetic, I think. He was well, unhinged. He wasn't played by Paul Darrow. But he was like, <laughs> energy-wise, he was very like calm and, and almost down to earth. Oh, yeah, for sure. But no, this, is, this, all, this Avon also feels almost parodic of Blake. In a way. And I think that's something that at least I want to talk about near the end of the season, if that's something that continues through Series D, because I think that might be a reason maybe why some people dislike Series D. Maybe. I don't have a problem with this episode, at least. I, I don't necessarily like have this a, episode a lot, actually. problem with it either. I want to see if that's something that continues in the season. And obviously, I don't think they set out to make this season a parody of the previous ones. I think it's just where they decided no, but to I mean, take like, the characters. I mean, like these things can shine, whether they, whether they, whoever they are. Well, I'm just using know. they to refer as the production team, right. meaning the combination of actors, writers, everyone who is involved in the show. Yeah, right. Whether, I mean, whether anyone sat down and was like, all right, let's make this a parody or not, like these elements can shine through right. and have an effect on on your viewer viewing or not yours and your but like mm -hmm. just the viewing in general by people of series d mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway avon's ordering everyone around yeah there was and a funny this, line here was like let's set the course for this asteroid standard by one and I was <laughs> really like, i didn't notice that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Tarrant, I think, was like, yeah, we're cruising, we're cruising at standard by one. And I was like, so just, so just standard, then. <laughs> this episode, and because we'd always in the past gotten these two different ways to talk about speed. We had standard by whatever, and mm -hmm. then we had time distort whatever, right? Yeah. And it always seemed as if those two were, were, were like different. Those two were different scales. But in this episode, they're the same. I don't know if you Well, I think that. in this episode provides an explanation for... Not that this them. matters. I don't know why we're going so deep into well, this. Well, I think but. I think this episode provides an explanation that time distort and standard by whatever are the same speed, but to achieve time distort X Y Z, you like actually distort time, and that's why they refer to it that way. Like that's the whole thing about this episode is that they can reach standard by fifteen in real time and not without like. Oh yeah, that's interesting. But they also I don't know if you noticed this. I forget where this is, but they like equate. They're like oh, they're because they realize that they're going. Time or sorry, standard by twelve or whatever, but that's mm -hmm. also time to store at twelve. Mm -hmm. You know, so but so yeah, I guess what you're saying makes sense. You know, it's a different yeah. uh, because, method. Well, yeah, because the the thing is when they, well, yeah, that's the thing because when they realize that this ship went standard by twelve, because here's a little bit of plot to explain where this is coming from. They accidentally crash into the asteroid. Because it's really to, funny. Avon, Avon's like, "Don't worry, trust me, it's all gonna work." We'll forgetting that they we'll don't have there. Zen to pilot the ship. <laughs> but they crash into this asteroid because they're trying to get into the system and there's these three ships that show up and they get blown up. And they find out later that this ship Federation went... Federation ships. Yeah, this ship went standard by 12, blew them up and like immediately left. And I think Avon... No, Villa says this actually. He, someone says, oh, standard by 12 wasn't possible. And, and Villa says standard by 12 wasn't possible in real time. I think it's Tarrant who says that. Yeah, someone says, like, stand Standard by 12 wasn't possible going real time. Yeah. So, I definitely think time distorted is, like, a different... Method. Yeah, different oh. power drive to the ship or something. Different star yeah. drive, you might say. <laughs> Thankfully, this week, it's really obvious what star drive refers to. I think a new segment on the show is going to be, what does the one-word title for this week actually <laughs> refer to? <laughs> Well, this is also sort of the first... The first scene in this episode is really the first scene that we actually get Sulin's character, you know? And the first in time way, I noted down what Sulin's hair is doing. 
<laughs> which isn't really anything wacky in this episode, I don't think. No, it's kind of it's up with a uh, the black thing with a black. I don't know what it's called. Black this plastic. is why I didn't go into cosmetology <laughs> with a black hair holder. <laughs> yeah, there's the title of the episode. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the first time yeah that Sulin actually has any sort of character they do give her some lines in a little bit where they draw on her background and she talks about Dana and she actually does bring up something we mentioned with John that Dana and Sulin seem to have somewhat similar backgrounds or training at least right but that's not till a little bit later she also calls into question Dana's like skills considering and she she actually mentions this Sulin that has mentions her sheltered upbringing but i just want to say this was this was a dana episode like when you really think about it dana was awesome yeah. in this mm, i know save, she was save for one scene save really? for one what scene, was that one scene which isn't even her fault it's just somebody decided that dana's got to be beat up by the space rat so there's a fight later on in what is quite possibly the worst choreographed fight in Blake 7, <laughs> by the way. Where she's fighting the space rat and like she starts winning and you're like, yeah, awesome, Dana's awesome. But then you like just all of a sudden Tony around starts yeah. choking her and I was like, yeah. oh, what? We'll get that it. was the only time I was like, oh, man. You're like kicking your arches down like Chris Boucher. We'll, we'll get there. We're going really out of sequence this episode, which is fine. Because, well, anyway, they, crash in, they crashed. Whatever, you know. They crash into the asteroid, or they scrape alongside the asteroid. Kind of like how you scrape. I don't know where I was going with that, but they scraped alongside the asteroid. It is, it's an asteroid. Yes, it is yeah, an asteroid. It's an asteroid. <laughs> and the Federation ships show up. that NASA chart again. <laughs> it's the difference between an asteroid and a meteor, meteorite, whatever, whatever the other ones are. Yeah, and, and what as soon as Avon is, is like, just trust me, we're gonna get real close. We're just gonna, we're just gonna skim it. We're not gonna, not gonna make contact. And then as soon as he says that, there's just this mini explosion in the corner. And then it cuts to this really great model work of the Scorpio model dragging along the side of the asteroid model. The Scorpio model in this, as it did in um, Rescue, looked great. Yeah, but as it did, the as asteroid it did in was tra- questionable. I thought the asteroid looked pretty good, but there's an, a weird line here. Where things are going wrong, and Villa runs up to Avon, and he's like, I know this was my suggestion, but I told you not to do it, and he runs off. Did you notice that? Yeah, yeah. and I just was figured I... that meant that like, it was his idea to use the asteroid as radar cover to enter the system. We didn't mention that the reason why they're getting so close to the asteroid is to get into this Federation system without being detected. Right, and the reason they need to do that is because Scorpio runs on a material that they can only get at a certain <laughs> location, kind of like uh, the Liberator was revealed to in Series C. <laughs> But then they find, like, an wait, infinite store wait, of wait it. Wait a minute. Was that Dawn of the Gods where they were going to get that power supply? I think it was. I think it was. Jim <laughs> Follett. I think it was. <laughs> but they also found, like, an unlimited supply in that episode, too, and never mentioned it again, <laughs> so. As they do in this story, they find an entirely new power system that doesn't run on the same energy at all. Ron, do you fall it? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the Federation interceptors show up and they're like, we're going to blow you up. Well, they don't contact them, but they're like in a threatening stance. This isn't right away. They're sort of, Avon and Tarrant have to go into some room and, and fix something. Avon and Tarrant seem to be getting along. Yeah, for now. <laughs> they get along quite well in this episode. Yeah, they seem to be on the same page with the whole... Sending manipulate, Dana and, yeah, manipulating Dana, Dana Villa. Villa thing. Sulin's <laughs> just like, this is kind of weird, uh, guys. I kind of like how they didn't make a big deal about Sulin like being the newcomer or anything. She just well, fitted, is which is because, obviously a result of it being Callie's right. lines. But yep. I kind of like that they didn't make this huge deal that she was like a newcomer and they made her prove herself or whatever. But I mean. I like that she just joined the crew and yeah. she's just there. Sure. I mean, there's there's been some time also between these episodes. Right. But there's also, I feel like Su Lin, in some way in the beginning of this episode, at least does have her own character. Like, maybe, right. it's, maybe it's just Glynis Barber's acting or something that's very different from Jan Chapel. Mm-hmm. But despite the fact that these are Callie's lines, it feels like a different character. Yes, I agree. For some reason, I don't even really know why. I'm sure it comes down to the acting, I think. 
in my opinion. Anyway, they make it back to Zen on base. They limp back to Zen on base <laughs> with a busted power unit. And all that. Oh. So I don't want to tell you what I found in this footage, but you can find it yourself. They decide to go through it frame by frame at 10,000 frames per second. Yeah, it's like, it's like a six-second clip or something like that. And I was like, all right, that's not going to take that long. And they're like, by the way, it's 10,000 frames per second. You're on the first shift, Dana. <laughs> I think you put and, Villa on the first shift, actually. No, I don't remember. You know what? I don't sure remember. It was Dana. It's probably Dana. But, you know but what? we skipped the entire thing where Villa pretends to be drunk and he gives them this suggestion of how to get out inside Scorpio without uh, spacesuits. Yeah. Which was kind of funny. Yeah. You don't need to really detail that too much because that's exactly what it was. But then here's here's another thing with Sulin's character is Villa's pretending to be drunk and. He like, hits on her. Yeah, he, yeah, and basically. By hits on her, I mean, he says, like, some things that could be consi- considered sexual harassment. Right. And she just, like, walks away. <laughs> She's, like, having none of I think drunk da- villa. There's a, there's a classic and humorous Chris villa. Boucher line. It's humorous because it's Chris Boucher and it's snappy, but at the same time, it's, like, really questionable where Dana's like, oh, villa, you can be, like, so... I don't know the word she is, like, repulsive sometimes. And Phil's like, well, I can be repulsive all the time. Right, yeah, that's what it and was. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? Where's the lovable, affable villa? Where's the lovable Series A villa? Yeah, <laughs> before he was revealed to be a manipulative Lying, alcoholic. <laughs> alcoholic, womanizer. <laughs> Oh, God. Villa's the real enemy. <laughs> if you really think about it, Villa's been manipulating everyone for his oh, own yeah. gains. Yeah, definitely. Avon thinks he's got control. No, it's actually Villa. <laughs> I mean, in Villa a way, yeah. Like, in a way, Villa reveals... Villa, in a way, this scene is actually Villa playing his hand more openly than really he really ever has done. Yeah, we sh- did we mention that the reason why he's playing drunk because he says this is like no one ever volunteers the drunk guy to fix equipment. Right, because he doesn't want to go outside and, and do this thing himself. So that's why. They use a force wall. Villa has another funny line because Avon tells Slave to make a force wall around the affected section so they can go in there. And then Villa's like, I wouldn't want to trust any force wall made by Slave either. <laughs> but it works. Yeah, and they repair the ship with this magic gun that just seems to patch up the whole... Well, this is um, not foreshadowing. I don't know what the word is, but this is a hint at what they're going to use it for later, which is the opposite It's a mode. call forward. Sure, call forward. I guess they just flip the switch and have it go into, like, destruct mode later on. <laughs> <laughs> It does. I mean, they set it up pretty well. They're like, all right, this is going to take an hour. <laughs> and it does take a considerable amount of time later on. But right, they make it back to Xenon base or Xenon, however you pronounce it. I think they say Xenon. I think it's, I guess it would depend how it's spelled, which if we had scripts, <clears throat> John, sure. would be <laughs> nice. <laughs> pretty sure it's Z-E-N-O-N. That's inter- actually yeah. interesting. We were talking about the the relationship between slave and slaves like mm-hmm. and how historically almost all not almost all but a lot of slave owning societies worldwide uh would take slaves their slaves from other areas and then we have this planet called xenon right mm-hmm. xeno the foreign so interesting connection there yeah because i was just wondering if it's spelled with an x like the element xenon x-e-n-o-n yeah it's spelled with a z Xenon. I'm pretty sure they call it Xenon, so I'm just going to call it Xenon. Right. And that that, that Zeno, Zeno, whatever, it is, that's foreign. So. Mm-hmm. Greek, Greek, right? Or Latin? <laughs> Greek, probably. <laughs> I think it's Greek. It sounds Greek. Considering it has an X in it, yeah. Sounds Greek. money that it was be Greek. But they're back. And I don't know, how do you feel about them having a base? How do you feel? Um, how do I'm you okay think? With it. How do you think Terry Nation would feel about them having a base? Uh, Terry Nation would be like, "This is the worst decision that's ever happened." <laughs> I don't know. Actually, if I don't think he'd okay go that far. It. I don't think he'd go no, that far. No, I don't think he would. Uh, I think he'd be like, "That's I a little question." I think he'd find it to be a questionable move. I'm okay with it. I don't know I if think I'm okay it with it. Changes up the show. I mean, this is the first episode where they've really used it as a base. I think it'd be better to like 
see how they use it if they actually use it as a base or if they just use it as some sort of like safe haven to run back to every so often no what's the difference really well, i think if they use it as a base then it like actually serves like a story purpose i guess like in this they have to limp back because the ship's been heavily damaged and they need to retreat to safety and they need to watch the video so they need to watch the video at the base like that i was like okay that makes sense but if they just like fly to a space station pick up some goons fly home they don't do anything at the base and they fly out of the base again it's going to be like well why did you need to fly back to the base right i guess i mean sure i there's also wow what was i gonna say huh i hate when that happens (laughs) whatever okay (laughs) okay (laughs) dana finds this tiny little space hopper and villa's like oh shoot that's a space hopper and they're like what and he's like you used to be the fastest little ship you go like standard by six or something. Well, it's going standard by 12. He's like, yeah, I couldn't go that fast. And then the Federation outlawed them anyway. And they're like, oh, well, zoom in. They do the, the CSI actually, thing where they zoom in actually, on his helmet. And I'm just, I'm just sort of correcting this, I guess, because it's Su Lin. But it's actually like they cut, because Dana was on the first shift, and they cut, and then Su Lin like falling asleep. But then she notices the space hopper. Yeah. Chopper, I think it was actually. Is it Hopper? Or Ch- I think it was Chopper. I thought it was Hopper. I think it's Chopper because of bikes, right? Like, you know, yeah. you're Chopper. I guess. They zoom in on my helmet and Villa's like, oh shoot, it's a space rat. I don't want to deal with the space rats. And they're like, who's space rats? And he's like, space rats hate everybody, including other space rats. They're basically this villainous gang that just steals anything they want to steal. Anything with wheels, Terrence says. Anything that goes fast, Villa says. And they kill everything else. <laughs> yeah. Or that indicates that the type of drive used in that space vehicle is <laughs> some sort of theoretical drive uh, that was designed by dr praxton. praxton i remember what i was gonna say now is that now that now that they don't have the liberator the liberator gave them like the potential to just fly mm-hmm. the liberator was their base and their ship right so yeah. you have to think does, is scorpio advanced enough and i guess the answer is no to serve yeah. as their base and their ship yeah that's all i want but say. i mean again i was getting ahead of myself a little bit again but again this feels like almost a parody because now they're like they find this super powerful star drive that's literally faster than anything in the galaxy including the liberator less than go standard by 15 Didn't the, wasn't the liberator's top speed standard by 15 i thought it was standard by like eight i thought the fastest we ever saw it go on screen though was standard by 12 uh, yeah you know it might have been 12 i don't remember but now they've got this engine yeah, that can go can standard go by 15 and it's like it's the fastest engine in the galaxy especially since the liberator's destroyed so right I mean, we'll have to see where they go with this. Are they going to slowly build up Scorpio to where it's better than the Liberator? I doubt that. Or because the Liberator be was like made it. of undestroy, undestroyanium, <laughs> indestructibanium, <laughs> right up until they flew through little space moss. <laughs> <laughs> wow, who would have thought space moss would take down the strongest ship in the galaxy, universe even? Multiple galaxies, at least. This one and Andromeda. So they decide to go hunt down the space rats because they're trying to find Dr. Praxton because they're like, well, we can use that really quick. We could use that, that engine in Scorpio. Then we wouldn't have to do Avon's stupid modifications to make the ship quicker that he was trying to get a rack to do. Right. So they... I don't remember how, but they tracked down the space rats to this uninhabited planet somewhere. I think it's just known, like, where the space rats hang out, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and then they beam Dana and Villa down, and I'm going to skip ahead, like, one scene, because the next time we cut back to Scorpio, Sulin's like, hey, shouldn't they be, like, reporting in? And Avon's like, well, we're waiting for them to get captured. And she's yeah. like, wait, what? And he's like, yeah, I mean, look at all that radiation from poorly maintained video cameras and all that other radiation that can only come from a high, <laughs> high budget research base. That I didn't tell them about, you know? <laughs> so was like, wait, what? And you sent them into a trap and Avon's like, yeah, pretty much. And then Terrence's like, we need that engine. We <laughs> yeah, need Taren, that star drive. Terrence is completely on board with this. Yeah, which kind of blew my mind. He was just like completely okay with completely manipulating Dana and Villa with holding information from them and sending them into this dangerous situation completely uninformed. You know, actually, this is something 
that I thought Tarrant would be on board with, but that Avon, if Series C was any indication, maybe wouldn't be. <laughs> Not anymore. But now we have unlimited Avon. That's what I'm calling him now. I'm just going to call him unlimited Avon. He's None like that Hulk, series C, Hulk series mode D, Avon. Avon nonsense. Sure. You wouldn't like Avon when he's angry? Well, that's his secret. He's <laughs> always angry. <laughs> that's from the Avengers. You mean Avengers? Yeah, the Avengers. Avengers assemble. <laughs> uh, Dana and Villa like look at one of the security cameras that Villa mentions, and <laughs> I mean <laughs> Avon mentions. Really funny. And Villa's like, "Oh, it's an old camera. Looks to be like a couple decades old. Probably hasn't been maintained in years." And it's like <laughs> zoom out to people watching this footage in a room <laughs> <laughs> with sick mohawks. Oh yeah, all right. We gotta just uh, sidebar. Take sidebar. <laughs> And talk about the space rats design, their outfits and everything. <laughs> I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> all right, so they've all got This is definitely sh- the okay. most like art deco. I, mean, I don't know. Like, this is outfit. the most 80s biker gang biker <laughs> gang I've ever seen. <laughs> because it's it's, you know, you know the 80s that had all those like bright neon colors on everything. And everything was like geometric so I shapes. Heard. I mean, I wasn't around to witness anything. Everything of you've seen from the 80s is like bright neon colors and geometric shapes. Now take that and turn that into a mohawk and face paint. And plastic wrap used as clothing. Hey, I thought that looked pretty good until <laughs> I realized it was plastic, plastic wrap. You know, They've got colored, huge mohawks, you know, too. They're, like, two feet tall. It, I mean, it is. I wouldn't doubt that it is just that, like, decorative colored plastic wrap that you can get. At the supermarket. Right. Yeah, the mohawks were, were pretty awesome. Let's, they were let's huge. Be I and thought for sure. Tip, not frosted tips. Colored tips. When Dana was fighting the one, I thought for sure it looked like his mohawk was going to come off. <laughs> like, the actor's I mean, mohawk was going to come off. Those were definitely, like, wigs, right? Yeah. I mean, but they had the face paint done in, like lightning bolt slash arrow symbols that look i don't know if you noticed this but it looked like they ran like they ran into the hair and they had look they dyed their hair like to continue the pattern i didn't notice it on the leader dude i noticed it was a dude with pink face paint he was the it one was, I really it was all it of them yeah it was all there's a funny scene where the leader walks into the lab and she's like no no get your dirty hands out of here and he's like nah man sweat is natural <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, oh, God, imagine what they smell like. <laughs> she does. She tells the two lackeys to take a bath, and they're like, no, nah, we never take baths. Yeah, sweat is natural. <laughs> we bathe in our own sweat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Vomit on recording. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they have Praxton in custody ish she's like willingly working for them because they provided all the raw materials required to build her thing <laughs> they the space rats this gang are the only people in the galaxy willing to fund her well research. i was thinking about this that like it, this is a pretty big problem now in <laughs> in america anyway is that like it's really difficult for some people to find money to support their research and well, it's probably not very important research anyway, right? <laughs> that's the thing is like... If it doesn't benefit big oil, you know? I mean, yeah, that, I mean, that's like an actual thing is that like when you pitch your idea to the U.S. government, there's, there's like a whole thing and it's known at least among physicists that like you've got to pitch it to them in a way that like you can tell them some way in the future in which this technology that you're researching or whatever you're researching can either make money or benefit a corporation and somehow like you have to pitch yeah, it that way i don't doubt that at all and it's like that's part of the reason why like you know the large hadron collider did you know that america was building one like twice the size in texas and they dug out the entire tunnel the entire tunnels dug out or most of the tunnels dug out before the, the government shut the program down and they shut it down because someone was like do we really think we can make money from the research this could get? Yeah, probably not. So they canceled the whole thing. But it's like that, if that collider existed, like it could reach energies of, I think, up to two or three times the Large Hadron Collider could now and could have led to a whole lot of discoveries that like we may not see in our lifetime anyway. So nice. The story does like 
an interesting and pretty good job of demonstrating that like it's actually pretty difficult to find scientific funding for a lot of things it's, although in this instance it's weird because you would think the federation would fund this super fast engine that like I mean, we discussed this last week maybe the federation is keeping their eye on this and are waiting to swoop in and steal um from praxton once she that's probably it. what it is because orac theorizes when they see the interceptors that the federation only just got their shipbuilding capability infrastructure back, on back online and so that's these are the these three interceptors are the first of like a new batch that it they just sort of started building to travis's pursuit ships almost you know the three of them but what's well, also interesting that i want to mention is that nasa is actually doing research today into an engine very similar to the one in very similar to how they described dr praxton's engine huh. described dr praxton's engine as using light particles to generate uh, momentum to power the ship nasa's been researching a very similar uh, a similar engine for long uh, interstellar journeys because it's, it's extremely energy efficient and basically compact but so far you know it's been difficult because it's uh it's not like you can just send something up into space every day and test it in space and also like it's a very theoretical engine that requires like a really complicated system to make work so but nasa huh. is interestingly doing research into a very similar engine design yeah yeah you know maybe the uh maybe i'll see if i can find um some research on it that i can put in the show notes sure Maybe the Space Force can put that to good use. Oh, boy. <laughs> Who are the Space Force going to fight? <laughs> the Andromedans, obviously. Right. <laughs> because Andromeda is not, t- like, light years away. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm, all I'm saying is I'm ready for Blake 7 to become reality. Not in your <laughs> lifetime, my friend. Or mine, for that matter. I'm ready for the, the Federation to, to control everything. Freedom... Who needs any of it? The way things are going, Russia is going to be the federation that's controlling everything, if we're being honest. We're all going to be speaking Russian in this real-life Blake 7 universe. (laughs) Anyway, Dana and Villa get captured, as Avon predicted, and then him, Villa, sorry, him, Tarrant, and Sulin land Scorpio on the planet and infiltrate by avoiding all the cameras because they're like, we're... I guess that was the plan all along. Yeah, it was. And they're planting mines, I guess, all over the place. <laughs> to cover their retreat, I guess. I mean, yeah, that's how they get those guys off their tail at the end. Yeah, Avon does use one of those mines. But yeah, Dana and... There are a few scenes, actually, of Dana and Villa running around, and then they get captured. Yeah, but those aren't important. <laughs> We do get a scene with Praxton and the leader of the Space Rats. Yeah, the leader had a name. There's actually They actually gave the leader somewhat of a backstory. He says he's not a Space Rat, but as long as he they gives them... They recognize him as the leader. They recognize him as the leader because he provides them with, like, vehicles or something like that, if I remember correctly. Yeah, something like that. So there's definitely, like, a backstory going on there, but none of it really ends up mattering. Yeah, and he says that him and Dr. Praxton could rule the galaxy side by side. Where have I heard that before? <laughs> Praxton also has an assistant named Napier, who's really just there. And doesn't escape I with them. Yeah, I think she so dies. from an from a episode-making perspective, like from a TV-making perspective, why was Napier even in this story? Like, it seems like he's just another person to pay. He doesn't really contribute anything. You know, that's a good point. And plot-wise, either he doesn't contribute anything. Exactly. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I got nothing. I'm surprised I even remembered his name. I didn't even know he had a name. <laughs> Why did he have a name? <laughs> Why do you remember his name and not the leader of the Space Rats? <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> Forgot to mention the first time Dana and Villa see the space rats, they ride up on their ATV tricycles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we didn't mention also when we were talking about their costumes, the giant shoulder pads. <laughs> Which are... Giant. Giant. And, and there. And neon. 
and awesome. So we should point this out also, is that the, uh, and I don't know if I should even like say this, you know, you might have to bleep this out what I'm about to say. Well, I, just, that, I could just delete it if it ends up being sure. is controversial that, or sensitive. Or? Is, is that the space rat's term for either, like, I guess just anyone who's not a space rat is a gook. Oh, yeah. yeah. Which is like a racial slur. Yeah, it seemed <laughs> to me that later on they imply that they only use that term to refer to people in the Federation because when they meet Dana and Villa, they're like, oh, you're not. Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah, they're like, you're not, you're not Federation. Yeah. And then someone's like, well, it's all the same. Yeah. Something like that. It was so weird. I mean, is that term is that term not known or is not used in the UK, possibly, you know? Possibly, or maybe it wasn't as prevalent in the 80s, 81. Uh, I mean, I barely I just noticed it. Like, it's just, it stood out to remember me. that that was a racial slur, right? Like, I don't think it's that prevalent. Yeah, I guess you're today. right. It's not really that prevalent today. I mean, I knew it was a racial slur, but at the same time, it's like it's not one of the, like, big three, I guess. <laughs> what are the big three? I don't know if I, I can say don't them. say them. <laughs> Anyway, they are able to steal the drive. Dana and Villa pretend to be stu- former students of Dr. Praxton. Oh, yeah, this, this was the funniest part of the episode to me, is that Dana, after you know being really awesome, you know, having this fight, which, yeah, this is the moment, moment you mentioned where she's like winning, really winning, but then she, you yeah. know, due to the story... And also due to the worst choreographed fight in Blake 7 history, <laughs> there are a couple punches that... It's almost a pillow fight because they're in this, like, lounge area. Almost, but also there's a couple of punches that, like, you know in TV, like, when they're throwing punches, they're obviously, like, missing real well, but they really yeah. frame it so that it looks like it hits. There are, there are a couple in this that, like, pretty obviously miss. <laughs> That's why there's a lot of shaky cam in fight scenes, by the way. That's the reason, is because people are whiffing intentionally. <laughs> but you can tell in this yeah. this fight that there, there are some whiffs. <laughs> They should have actually punched each other. <laughs> uh, but no, so so they get captured, and Dana's like, Praxton, it's... I well, so, so... This... Uh, no, no. <laughs> so they tell the leader guy that they're former students of Praxton, and if he takes them to Praxton, they're going to get her to cooperate and do his bidding, basically. To work on the star drive. Right. They mention the star drive that no one's supposed to know about. And as soon as they get into Praxton's research lab, I guess. Dana's like, Praxton, it's us, your former students, Dana and Villa, who worked with you to create the star drive, remember? She's like, wink, wink, nudge, you. nudge, play along or we're all gonna die. And she's like, I don't know you. And then Dana's like, I guess we'll just go like all in now, I guess you're not playing along. This model's not as efficient as the one we built in the lab. That would be okay considering the conditions you're working under and then the leader gets really mad. He's like, what do you mean not efficient? <laughs> She's like, no, I don't know these people. And he's like, either you know them or you won't. <laughs> uh, Praxton, God. But right at that moment, Dell and Avon and Sulin okay. bust through the wall. Right, it's, it's not right at that. Okay, so like 10 minutes ago, Derek started using the dis- wall destroying slash repairing gun Beam. to destroy the wall. And this is the wall that he was destroying. As we find out 10 minutes later when they bust through the wall, and they're like, it's us. <laughs> and they hold everyone at gunpoint. Avon holds his gun like a six-shooter. As I did notice, it's really yep. obvious. Mm-hmm. And they decide to make off with the star drive, and Pax is like, take me with you. And they're like, we'll take you and your star drive. <laughs> Paul Darrow delivers in a really menacing and over-the-top way. And then they, they get jump, into the spaceship. They jump in like a, a little cart type thing. That actually has four wheels, surprisingly. Yeah. They go zooming away, and then the, the space rats are following close on their heels. You notice how you only see like two or three space rats at a time? Because they only had like two or three of those. Yes, because one of the people they hired to be a space rat became Napier. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. But uh, yeah, they, they make it back to Scorpio. And then there's still like six, seven minutes left. Yeah, like, like a substantial they amount of time. Like, all right, what are they going to do in these six or seven minutes? And they do one of the most unexpected things on the show, real on Blake Seven, really. I totally didn't see this coming. 
And I was okay. pretty shocked. I assume you're talking about Paxton dying. Yes. Okay, because I was going to say them being pursued by Federation ships, totally predictable. Oh, yeah. saw that coming a mile For away. For sure. But they're like, we're just out of their firing range in like an hour. We'll be within the firing range. Weirdly enough, The Lost Jedi, like that final 10 minutes, like the entire plot of The Lost Jedi was, we're running away from the sh- ships and we'll be in their firing range in like two hours. Do you remember? You've seen Lost Jedi, yeah. right? Yeah, I think I just completely erased that scene from my memory. It was like the whole plot of the movie was like the ships were like... Oh, yeah. Well, not in the last like 10 yeah. minutes. I, I, no, I don't know. Like I don't was, remember, actually. It was like really similar, though. They were like running away from the Empire, in this case, the Federation. Yeah, they were yeah. just out of firing range. And then in like some in, it, it, somewhat indeterminate but rather long amount of time from now, they'll be within firing range and like get destroyed. Right. Yeah, yeah. I remember all that. <clears throat> so... Well, yeah, I guess kind of weird, a little similar. But yeah, but like in one, I hated that from that movie. That entire setup, people hated that. I, didn't. I thought that I mean, was I fine. I mean, I didn't. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, I didn't hate it. I hate that movie for other reasons. No, I don't hate yeah, it. Actually. Are, are, I don't hate it. I have problems with it. I don't hate it. I have problems with it though. I think it has one of the best scenes in all of Star Wars. Kind of like the Phantom Menace as the best scene in all of Star Wars. But yeah, so there's like an hour before the ship. Is going to be within firing range. And it and takes, then, it's going to take yeah. 50 minutes to install the drive. Braxton's like, I can install the drive in 50 minutes. And he's like, do it in 45. But yeah, while she's installing it, Avon already starts punching in the coordinates and they're like, wait, what are you doing? She'll get vaporized like as soon as you plug that in. And he's like, well. His answer doesn't make sense. She's like, well, she's dead anyway. So I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah, because he's like, yeah, no, his answer doesn't make sense. Because his reasoning is like, Oh, if we give her, I guess his reasoning is if we give her time to get out of there, we'll get hit by the plasma bolt and we'll all die. But if we just vaporize her in there, then at least we can get away. I guess that's his reasoning. But he doesn't even say that much. He basically, he basically just says, she's dead. We can make it out if we, if I do this. Mm -hmm. But why? Why is she dead? Why is she not going to make it out? (laughs) I think this is just Avon covering for his new murderous tendencies. I mean, yeah, like I said, it's probably like a thing where it's like if they don't activate the drive at that moment, the plasma bolt will catch up to them and hit them and they'll all die. Yeah, But I, I guess, don't know. I guess. I thought I mean, it was weird too. I'm just like... Can't they just wait like... I'm being an Avon apologist, <laughs> I guess. I mean, couldn't they just wait three minutes for her to like run back up and then do it? Maybe yeah. not. Maybe not. Maybe they couldn't I have. Know. I don't know. But she dies and I totally didn't see this coming. And then they end on a sitcom moment. It's like even more out of place because Avon just straight up murdered this woman. Where they're like, but what about Dr. Praxton, Avon? He's like, who? <laughs> oh, God. So dark. It was, I was shocked at how dark it was. This reminds me of an episode of Dark Matter where they steal this very fast drive called the Blink Drive from a corporation. And the episode ends with them like running away from the corporation, chasing after them. There's got to be activate. a direct. I'm sure um, it's like homage. a direct homage. And at the end of the episode, they have to activate the blink drive to get away, and they they're like rushing to adapt it and plug it into the system, and it, and then things go wrong, and, and <laughs> that takes a different direction because like the blink drive shunts them into another into an alternate universe, which huh. is interesting. But that's like a mashup between this and Dawn of the Gods, <laughs> kind of. That's like a really hope people haven't watched Blake Seven episode. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I mean, like even if you have watched it, it's fine. I mean, the setup of Dark Matter is like in many ways pretty similar to Blake Seven. It's like crew of criminals in a world run by evil people I guess as well everybody's evil I guess is my point <laughs> anyway in regards to this yeah it was a yeah I was kind of shocked at that ending like at how dark it was and just how Avon just so casually like right I mean kills this person. we've had things like this before like the web where Blake and Avon just leave them all to die really mm-hmm. or some other instances Dawn of the Gods, I guess, where they just leave Dawn the people the gods, behind. They leave to die. all the people behind. For even. no reason, really. Again, There's no reason wait in a that minute. Instant. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> I'm on to you, Fallout. <laughs> We're on to you. I mean, there have definitely been instances where they just leave these people to die, but this was like Avon made a direct decision to kill her, to basically. Kill her. In order to further his own gains. Someone, and. and but how and does this further his own gains? But, but I think. The difference is that we've had that before, but it's always been like, oh, they kill like a Federation guard is in the way. This was like someone who arguably hasn't done anything to wrong Scorpio or and has the in crew. fact helped them, saved them actually. Yeah, she just saved, saved them. them. 
has in fact done basically no wrong ever. She just wanted to build her theoretical like star drive and then... Well, no wrong as far as we see on screen. You know? Okay, as far as we know. No, but no, I get what you're saying. And they just decide to vaporize her. <laughs> yep. And we see her scream too. Like we see her like... Yeah, this, that's... It's a pretty tense scene because she's got the little wires and she's getting ready to connect them and she connects them and we like see everything turn red and she screams. Yep. And this is also indicative of how in control Avon really is. How out of control and in control he is. How in control of Scorpio he is, but how out of control like in what he's doing mentally kind of thing. Yeah, because I mean, they don't want, it's clear that at least Dana and probably everyone else doesn't want to do this. If they don't have well, to, if they don't have to, uh, who says the line at the end was a Tarrant or Sue Lynn is like, well, what about Doctor Praxton? Like they obviously cared at least too, right? I thought Villa, it was prob- Villa probably doesn't care one way or the other, but probably doesn't want her to die, right? You know, um, but they just Avon just makes the decision for everyone. Yeah, no one even makes an effort to stop them, him either, right? Nobody makes a move. To deprogram yeah, the coordinates. This or, new Avon's probably liable to just shoot them where they sit. That's true. <laughs> They're probably all scared of him, honestly. I would be. <laughs> if this guy who like was pretty reasonable and a pretty good leader in the past season, the past year, all of a sudden decided to go completely unhinged yeah. on me, I'd be like, Wow, holy <laughs> moly, not gonna cross him. <laughs> That actually brings up a good question. Maybe we don't have to get too deep into this because it's already a pretty long episode, but what do you think would happen if one of the Liberator crew decided they didn't want to be... Sorry, God, Scorpio crew decided... I guess there'll always be the Liberator crew. Except for Sulin. <laughs> yeah, true. And Slave. Uh, what if one of them decided, like, nope, I'm out. Not I don't think Avon anymore. would let them go, honestly. I, I, this Avon, anyway. Yeah. I, think, I think this Avon would be like, no, you're staying, or I'll kill you. You remember last season where he told Tarrant he'd have to kill him if he tried anything? Like, that was right at the end of Series C. He's like, I'll shoot you in the back if I have to. Yeah, yeah, I guess. I'm inclined to think the same thing. <laughs> Which I think is actually something in my, uh, how would this be different if Terry Nation wrote it? Uh, which I think, first off, Avon's not as unhinged as he is in this Yeah, version. I think that's that's an overarching thing for all of this Terry Nation's segment is that mm-hmm. Avon probably wouldn't be as unhinged. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you agree with this, but I see this episode kind of being a little restructured if Terry Nation wrote it. I see it as being completely restructured. Yeah, I, I see it being restructured. The way I see it going is that they they start with them finding out about the Star Drive we, without that whole scene in the beginning, Terry Nation was pretty prone to having like time padding things, but I think, you know, looking at the later episodes of Series A, I think when he tended to pad the runtime out, it was in the the later half of the episode. So I think this episode, I think, in the Terry Nation Star Drive starts with them finding out about the Star Drive and and going to the planet to find it. Uh, Avon doesn't obviously manipulate Dana and in Villa into beaming down to the planet. And they go down willingly. And I think, I guess, the plot proceeds generally the same. I think there's more time spent fleshing out, like, what the space rats are and, like, what their purpose is. Because as it stands in this episode, the space rats are like, they just want to go fast and that's that's it. Whereas I think there's, like, something really interesting to be said about this, like, space biker gang. Because, uh, you know, no, biker gangs in real life are actually a lot more complex than just people who ride motorbikes. Like, a lot of them do a lot of char- charity work and... Uh, some of them don't, of course, some of them do other things, but so I think, in my opinion, we flesh out a little bit more what the space rats do. We start with them finding out about the star drive. They go there, and then maybe the scene with the asteroid gets shifted to the end uh, when they're trying to run away from the interceptors. I think maybe the interceptors show up two-thirds of the way through the episode when they're leaving and then like implementing the star drive is like the rest of the episode is that that's a bigger focus of the episode and they use the asteroids like buy themselves some more time and they scrape against the asteroids so their regular drive goes out so it becomes even more uh, pressing I guess to install the new star drive maybe Um, I just think Terry Nation was more prone to put his time wasting things at the end of the episode (laughs) which so I think that a lot of that you know installing the star drive using the asteroid all of that which felt like filler to me that would be at the end sure and i think you know what you're describing to me at least sounds a lot more boring and the changes i like this episode to me 
as we get into my changes, I think mm-hmm. this will be, or not changes, differences, I guess this will be apparent, is that I think this episode would be a lot more like, it would be worse like if Terry Nation yeah. were to write it. I mean, I agree. I mean, um, that's what I was thinking about when I was thinking about how you would do it. Anyway, continue. Also, just want to like point out that it's actually Plaxton, I just realized, and not Praxton, so yeah. we've been saying it wrong the entire time. She's also played by Barbara Shelley, who had a role in Planet of Fire I looked up in Doctor Who, which is <laughs> interesting. I don't know what she played in Planet of Fire, but something in there. Anyway, yeah, I, I do think there would definitely be some restructuring going on if Terry Nation had written this story. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the entire, or not, I think the entire first half, really, maybe the first thirty minutes mm-hmm. would be on the Scorpio. Because mm-hmm. I mean, you think back to a lot of Terry Nation stories, right? Like, right. Um, what was the first story of series B? Oh wow! Uh, redemption. Redemption. Back to redemption. The web. The redemption of the liberty, <laughs> which is not how that word is supposed to be used. And um, uh, probably a couple other ones that I'm forgetting, right? There's a lot of, I guess, padding-y stuff on the ship. You're right, yeah. Terry Nation likes to do his padding on the Liberator. <laughs> so, I mean, but that's what you were, uh, I guess, also saying, too. You just shifted it to the end. Yeah. So I think there would definitely be a lot more on the ship. I don't think they'd even learn about Plaxton until... 30 minutes in, basically. <laughs> None of this 10 minutes in nonsense we get in this. None of this quick moving stuff. No, but I think there would be, there would, he would definitely dive into the mechanical problems on the ship a little bit mm-hmm. more. You know, there would be problems mm-hmm. for them to solve as, you know, Avon and Taryn are out of commission. They have to wait an hour for this thing to happen, but the ships are on their tail and other things are going wrong and stuff like that. Right. Also, I'm not 100% sure that there would even be a biker gang in this. Yeah, see, that was the thing is that you know, I don't know how far we want to take this segment because, like, <laughs> to the furthest reaches. Because, like, if Terry Nation actually wrote a story, say that the, we boil it down to just the Scorpio, we boil it down to like the simplest form of the story. The Scorpio is trying to get a quicker power system. I think if we boil it down that far, like, yeah, I don't know if Terry Nation would even come up with the idea of a space biker gang. I don't think that would even exist. But right. if we're like looking at the story as it is, like, the biker gang is like in the way that Follett wrote it, is kind of an integral part to the plot of the story. Yeah. So I agree. I, I mean, what I'm saying is I agree with you. That if you go further than where I went with it, like yeah. if you went further than that, like, yeah, maybe maybe the biker gang doesn't even exist. Sure. And I mean, we can take this segment as far as like we want it because yeah. I mean, it's just hypothetical. And also we have, as Trader has shown, stories that were like, well, this probably wouldn't be that different mm-hmm. if Terry Nation had written it. I mean, but I think the, the consensus between the two of us is... One, there'd be more padding on the Scorpio. And two, I think it would be worse. Yeah, for sure. You know, I don't think that a lot of the concepts introduced in this episode were things that Terry Nation would probably do or come up with. Right. And I don't think necessarily the plot would flow as well as it did. You know, which is interesting to think about, I think. Especially considering in Rescue, we... Thought of, like I think the 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 this segment in rescue was like a lot of cool things actually mm-hmm. you know. I mean I think it's definitely going to depend. The segment is interesting because it's really variable and depends a lot on like the actual plot of the episode at hand. Right. More so than the other segments. It's interesting to think about though. I think it's an interesting hypothetical, especially in this case where it's like definitively yeah the Terry Nation version would probably be worse. Whereas I think at least for the past two weeks, like the Terry Nation version would be similar, but like he would cut some of the fluff that made the episodes bad. Yeah. I think in general, Terry Nation is a mediocre writer with some gems rather than a good writer with some flops. I think Chris Boucher, huh. I think Chris Boucher is a good writer with some flops, whereas I think Terry Nation is a mediocre writer with some gems. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, all I'm going to say is I definitely prefer Chris Boucher to Terry Nation. But, hey. <laughs> I would say that most people who have communicated with us do. I don't want to speak for the entire viewer base of Blake 7, but people we've talked to, I think, would agree. Yeah, I would say so. That being said, that kind of concludes my thoughts on this episode. Yeah, that's pretty much it for me. I definitely enjoyed it more than the past two weeks. I don't know if I enjoyed it more than Rescue, but... That's up there for this season anyway. Yeah. All right. So we have quite a few things to respond to this week, and we're probably going to go through them pretty quickly because of that. Because we do have quite a few. We have three emails and I think four comments on the website to get through. So probably not everybody's going to get really long responses this week, uh, just because we do want to get a chance to respond to everybody. And we also don't want this episode to run an hour and a half long because it's already 56 minutes. (laughs) 
All right, so the first one, uh, Rudolph, I think, arrived a little bit before we recorded this. This a little, a little bit before we recorded earlier the Star Drive originally, yeah, earlier in the week. <clears throat> uh, so, hi, just a quick note to say how much I'm enjoying your B7 podcast. A red day off, and all I've done is listen to several back-to-back in reverse order, having started with Rescue, thanks to a tweet on the superb Making Blake 7 tweet feed. Also enjoyed the guest on Sarcophagus, and the chat about reused sets was very interesting. Elements of the London... Flight deck were reused elements from Jerry Anderson's UFO, later used in Doctor Who The Green Death, whilst the underground base and terminal featured corridors from Alien. Huh. I'm full of useful, useless sorry, information on <laughs> Bake 7 and watching the show when it was first shown here in the UK. I have a semi-amusing story about the final episode. The Daily Mirror leaked on the day of transmission in the TV pages that all the crew... Uh, spoiler, 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 spoiler. The biggest spoiler in the history of TV when many of us were <laughs> expecting a fifth series. Grabbing a 10 pence from my mum, I walked to the local payphone box to ring the BBC, I spoke to some chap on the switchboard and told him about this Daily Mirror newspaper revelation and said the words, is it true? Three words spoken by Avon a few hours later, and he just replied, I'm afraid so. Many years later, I would discover that the location filming for the final episode was actually filmed 10 minutes from my house in Bracknell, Berkshire, if only I knew at the time. The final was a huge shock at the age of 13. It was my favorite show. It's still amazingly is my favorite show. I also served Chris Boucher while whilst working for Al Price, which is a video <laughs> retail shop in 1995. He lived in Ascot. Or Ascot, and we spoke at great length about the finale and remember trying to get him to watch Babylon 5 as the producer of that show was a Blake 7 fan. And then the last paragraph isn't relevant to this episode, but it's something that we're working on behind the scenes, so... <laughs> and then it's signed, Rob. Yeah, so, that's really interesting that you ran into Chris Boucher to yeah. a video store. <laughs> that's really interesting. Uh, if you ever did reach you, out, if you watch... find him again, ask him if he wants to be uh, on the podcast. Is he still... <laughs> I think he's still around. Yeah. Huh. Pretty sure he's still around. Okay. Did he ever watch Babylon 5? That's the big question is, did he yeah. ever watch Babylon 5? And I think we need to know. I think that's <laughs> vital information that we as fans of Blake 7 need to know. I always wondered if Babylon 5 was inspired by Blake 7 since the naming, the name of the show is very similar, I think, uh, to Blake 7. Babylon 5, Blake, well, Blake 7. Blake 7 doesn't have a monopoly on like word number No, schemes. but it's it's... It's like how Robert Ludlum named all his books the and the then name, name and then like noun. adjective or noun, sorry. <laughs> like the born supremacy, the born identity, <laughs> the Parsifal mosaic. And now when you see something named in that way, it's it's typically a, a, a homage to that. Like in Hitman, some of the con- contracts are named that way. And it, and the creator said, yeah, it's, it's supposed to be a direct homage to Robert Ludlum. The Da Vinci Code. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know that one. I don't know about that one. So thank you for emailing us, Rob. Thank you for reaching out. Let's check in here. A sh- short email from from RG before we have a longer email from her about this episode, which I'm bringing this up. Slave's accent isn't Aussie; it's working class British. I would class it as a London accent. And also, yeah, no. her comment about sulky didn't make sense to us because we missed reading this earlier email, but we actually did read that email. We cut it in onto the episode with John at the end. We were like awkward, like, John's not here to respond to this email because it arrived. <laughs> yeah, I, Actually, I, no, that was the other email. We did respond to your email with John. There was another email. <laughs> Look, all I'm saying is we responded to this email, but I completely forgot that you had mentioned that you were assaulted yeah, in the email. As that's, did I. That, that's why. But no, I mean, sense. I wanted to point out, like, I knew someone, and I was thinking probably RG is going to, like, call me out and, like, it's not an Australian accent. And I knew it probably wasn't anyway, but I just had to get it off my chest, but... Yeah, no, good to know for sure. Podcast of misinformation. <laughs> <clears throat> so from RG, Hi Zenith Space Rats, all the younger crew members of Blake 7 are separated on the ship again, so they don't misbehave. <laughs> I don't really like Slave's voice as much as Zen's or Urax. Really, I like Slave's better than both. Avon has started going insane. The crew don't have as many different costumes as they did in the first three seasons. The Space Rats feel like Precursors to the Reavers and Firefly, you can tell it's the 80s by their <laughs> mohawk haircuts and punk accents. I don't mind Villa and Dana together. Who needs dialogue when you can watch Avon, Tarrant, and Sulin running around a rock quarry? Dana True. has resorted to fisticuffs I, again. No, that was just a joke, but but yeah. <laughs> I love how they have her conveniently fall onto a plate of cushions. A pile of cushions, sorry. We get a close up on Tarrant's of <laughs> We get a close up on Tarrant's face for ages. I'm not complaining. There are a lot of bloopers of the dune bug that the Scorpio crew's riding in. It was highly impractical for the terrain. Oh, I hope that's in the uh, Blake 7 bloopers reels that are on YouTube. <laughs> what 
those exist. Yep. What Avon does to Dr. Plaxton is morally objectionable. I know that he justifies it by saying she'd be dead, anyway, dead anyway if the drive wasn't fixed, but his callous dismissal of her at the end of the episode is quite evil. We now have our anti-hero of the series firmly established. Down and safe, RG. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, maybe... <clears throat> I, mean, I don't think we we actually really touched on this, but maybe um, Avon sort of going insane is bringing back something of series A in how a lot of the characters feel kind of kind of dark when they first show up, right? Villa. Mm-hmm. Villa pickpockets Blake yeah, is the first thing right, he does on exactly. the show. Steals his watch. Yeah. The watch that's never mentioned again, nor do I actually know if we ever see it on Blake's wrist again. No, it was probably stolen by someone on the London or something like that, you know. Classic. Probably Raker, since he was like the only corrupt one there. <laughs> Captain seemed to be a good person, good enough, and the other guy just didn't care. Yeah, <laughs> complete apathy. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that, RG. Yeah. Thanks. Good information in there. Space rats are definitely a space biker gang. We do have here a rather lengthy email from Sergeant Jane. I'm starting to wish I had brought something to drink into this recording session because my throat is on fire. There's a bottle of glue right there. Wow, thanks. There's a <laughs> bottle of. Uh, wood varnish as well if I want <laughs> hey guys playing catch up looks like you're recording about a week of your head ahead of your releases so yep. hopefully this one makes it in about right yeah we are uh, fun fact and we're putting the responses in the correct episodes yeah so uh, hopefully this, yeah we get so many emails now and sometimes they get a little mixed up but I think we're doing a pretty good job so star drive a flawed episode in some ways but there are things I really like about it okay this is a long paragraph here we go <laughs> This is my first opportunity to really talk about Scorpio, and I have to say I really like this ship. I love the design. It looks like a baby Star Destroyer to me. I love yeah, the idea it that it's basically the Millennium Falcon of Blake 7. Sure, it's far less powerful than the Liberator, but somehow for me that's part of the charm. I love the way it deploys Batmobile style out of Xenon <laughs> base. And most of all, I love the concept really first actively in sport of this episode, that of an average ship that is slowly being modified and upgraded into something awesome. It already came with the cool computer. Once they fixed the teleport, it worked cooler than the Liberator's teleport. And now in this episode, they re- they get it outfitted with the super awesome Star Drive. I really look forward to seeing what future enhancements Scorpio will receive. Back when I first saw Series D, I liked Scorpio so much that I built it out of Lego to scale with the little Lego guys. Had that one for a long time until I finally took it apart to build a scale version of the dropship and APC from Aliens. Whew. Yeah, I couldn't agree more about Scorpio. Yeah. I like the, the design <laughs> of the outside. <laughs> of the outside. Also, the teleport is cooler than the Liberators in tall animals. When What's they, wrong with it in animals? They completely ditched the really cool teleport effect. Oh, they, they, lessen, they lessen it. I don't think no, they no, completely they, ditched they, it. They ditched it. It's gone. I think they lessened no, it. No, there's no like beam coming down from above. They just they just appear there. They're like red faded. There's definitely the swirly cube nope. things it's nope. yeah i also really like those clip guns like you guys mentioned previously they're basically han solo's blaster with interchangeable clips except that han's dl44 was made from a mauser while these guns look like they're made from <laughs> scratch they look really well made too very sturdy looking not sure if that's sarcastic or not in this episode, we, we start off with all our emails as if they're sarcastic about everything. <laughs> no. In this episode, we start off with Avon's plan to sneak into Federation space next to this asteroid. The crew is doubtful, but I feel like Avon's arguments make sense. Avon is also clearly in command here, effectively exerting his will over the rest, even when they're all against his plan. And the result is all Blake Seven. The plan goes wrong. The ship gets horribly damaged. And Avon gets told off pretty hard by Dana in one of his biggest egg on your face <laughs> moments of the series. Incidentally, this is absolutely my favorite Avon outfit. When I think of Avon, this is how I picture him. In fact, I agree with you guys from last week. By and large, I think these are the best costumes of the series. Nice bit of character development with Villa playing stupid drunk, but actually both coming up with a plan to save them all as well as ensuring he doesn't have to risk his neck to participate. Brilliant. Space rat, space chopper, space drive, space trade routes. My goodness, the ghost of Terry Nation feels very <laughs> present in this episode. Strange that the space rat leader says he's not a space rat. Dropped plot line. Sorry, lost count of all the Kerboy Avons this episode. Sai, ah, Sulin, you're supposed to be a badass gunslinger. Please stop blinking every time you pull the trigger. <laughs> Those ATVs the space rats ride around on are just not very intimidating, <laughs> are they? And of course, probably the most famous and well-remembered moment of the episode, Avon's Who. 
pretty cold, but at the same time, what other choice was there? All in all, a pretty decent episode. I'll give it a 6 out of 7. So I was starting to train the station out of the door. Interesting that you seem to have a little bit of an opposite opinion on, on Avon's line that IG did. IG's like, it's morally objectionable. It was wrong in every way. Whereas uh, you, Sergeant Janus, seem to be like, well, there wasn't really any other choice. Yeah, it was pretty cold, but what else were they to do? It's kind of interesting there, I think. The differing opinions on that moment. Right. And I don't know where I stand necessarily. I think it was wrong to just brutally murder her, but I do understand Avon's <laughs> reasoning that she didn't fix the star drive. They were all dead, but does Avon really have the power to choose her life over all their own? I guess is the question. But then we also have on the website some short comments from David. Uh, yeah, a f- couple short comments. And then also some comments from Jürgen. So... David says on episode 42, which was last week, the episode on Trader, I think the first six episodes of Series D suffer from the fact that they weren't written with Sulin in mind originally. It does sort of get better from episode 7 onwards. Robert Holmes is on poor form in this episode. He's so much capable of better than this. The upcoming episode, Orbit, is much better, but I will not spoil it for you now, but wait until then. David Sullivan Proudfoot. Yes, it does sound like a pseudonym, doesn't it? But no, he was a real person. He died in 2002, age 67. He directed three episodes, Traders with Jar Drive and Assassin. I think he was fired during the making of Assassin. He directed the location filming, but for the studio work, I think Phil Lorimer took over uncredited, as I think at the time there was a rule you couldn't be credited, both producer and director. According to IMDb, Proudfoot never worked again after Blake 7. You should name next week's podcast Punks in Space. I live in the northeast of England, by the way. I think we have a pretty good name for this episode, if I remember correctly. Uh, and there was a rule that you couldn't be credited as producer and as director and i think there's also a rule that you couldn't be credited as producer uh, sorry as script editor and as a writer for an episode or i think they they made special provisions for chris boucher in this and, and special provisions on doctor who as well chris boucher is pronounced closer to bow share first part like the front of a ship and the second part like the singer share <laughs> yeah it's interesting john actually on twitter said that he didn't know why he pronounced it Boucher on that one episode. And he said it's, it says it's rhymed with voucher, so there, which is how we've been pronouncing it, you know, yeah. voucher. So there seems to be differing opinions here. The only way to find out is to ask Chris himself, I think. Kind of like how I heard Neil Gaiman pronounce Neil Gaiman that by someone. And I was like, but now I don't know how it's actually <laughs> pronounced as a Gaiman or Gaiman. <sighs> Pretty sure it's Gaiman, though. I think, yeah, I think it's Gaiman. I only recently learned that Linus Barber is of South African descent too. Barber is her married name from her first marriage. She married young, but uh, the marriage only lasted a couple of years. I think she was already divorced when she played the Mutoid in Project Avalon. She later married her co-star in the crime drama series Dempsey and Make Peace, Michael Brandon, and I think they had two children together. They are still married to this day as far as I know. During the production of Series D, Barber and Pacey were having a romantic relationship. Ah, that's where I read that. I was trying to figure out where I read that. <laughs> That's really interesting. I think they are the two youngest actors on the show right now, right? Yeah, Josette yeah, Simon Josette might be Simon younger maybe. than Stephen Pacey. Yeah. We looked all this up weeks ago, but I can't even remember. Yeah, neither can I. <laughs> this is a Marmite episode. You will either love it or hate it. This referring to last week to trailer. Me person, person, me personnel, I think you mean me personally, I like this episode. It isn't the best, but it certainly deserves... All the hate to guess. In this series, if the series had to be screened during the autumn, this could have been a Halloween special. The final showdown between Avon and, and not Callie. Sorry, this is a, this comment is actually on the episode about... Sarcophagus. Sarcophagus. The final showdown between Avon and not Callie is amazing where he tells the alien, no deal, and you claim you can kill me, you better get on with it, make me die, there's nothing else you can do, and you're so beautiful when you're angry. That should read, doesn't deserve all the hate it gets. Yeah, that was another comment. Yeah. That's a comment underneath, which makes more sense because I was kind of wondering who hates <laughs> Sarcophagus. <laughs> Sarcophagus was a good episode. And then we have two little short comments from Jürgen. I assume I said it correct since you didn't email in to correct me from last <laughs> week, so I'm just going to keep going with it. Uh, he said on episode 18, BDSM America featuring Sergeant Drano, which is the first time we had Drano on, which is for the episode. Ah, Forgetting what it was called, too. Oh, bro, uh, not a breakdown. Um, the one where it's, Gan it's the dies. one where Gan dies. I'm forgetting what that one was called. Nice to hear, Sergeant Drano. Travis might have been defeated yet again, but he did manage to kill Gan effectively. <laughs> uh, and then we have... He actually replied to a comment by David on last week's episode. He said, on the subject of Safis and Afrikaans... Um, now, I actually don't know how to say this word, but I've seen it before. Z-U-I-D. I think it's pronounced like uh, Zud or Zid. 
uh, is exactly how we would write South in Dutch, which is where it's the same in Afrikaans, which is where the ZA abbreviation for South Africa comes from and not SA. Like I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, I think when uh, I think Jürgen used SA to refer to South Africa when SA is, is actually Saudi Arabia now, because I guess that's just what everybody agreed on. Yeah, I looked this up and I, I saw it written. I saw that word written with both an S and a Z. So S U I D mm-hmm. and Z U I D, and there might be differences as to when you would use one or the other. You know, mm-hmm. well, I yeah, couldn't really it, tell. It, it might just be like, like, you know, Russian words have multiple different ways you can spell them using the the Latin alphabet. Oh, maybe like Czar can be spelled C Z A R or T S A R. Both of those are accepted like Latinizations of the word Czar. Yeah. Which is weird because Czar is just Caesar. Like, that's where that word comes from. Yeah. But yeah, thanks for all the comments and corrections and tidbits of information, I guess. Yeah. Both David and Jürgen, thank you for commenting on the website. Thank you, Drano, Rob, and RG for emailing us. We always appreciate, again, hearing from our listeners and, and getting different viewpoints and hearing what you guys think. So, yeah, please keep writing in. Sorry if our response is a little shorter than usual today, but like I said, we had... We had five different people to respond to, which is definitely a personal record for us. So, And we know that a couple of people told us not to cut down on the number of responses if we get too many. So, The trade-off is that we're going to probably go a little quicker through them, which is fine. But anyway, thank you again for reaching out. If you would like to email us, you can reach us at thedoctordecadofvegetable.com. Questions, comments, concerns, angry rants, love letters, your thoughts on Star Drive. I almost forgot the name of the episode for a second. You can find us on YouTube at Decorative Vegetable. You can find us on Apple Podcasts and Google Play at Zenith, a Blake 7 podcast. Be sure to leave a rating if you like the show. Check us on Facebook. Trust your doctor. Like us on Facebook. Also check us on Twitter at TYD Podcast and follow us on Twitter. And next time we're watching animals. But until then, the end.